is delicious coffee. Thank you. Next, he fixes the car. Run. Here you go. Oh, uh, nail. Um, light bulb. All done. Then he probably has to fix the sink, too. Give me a hammer. Bang, bang. Well, it was hilarious. <laughs> Sorry it didn't work out. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> oh, man. Um... Hey, I'm going to start with an exciting announcement. We found our worship leader, uh, Miss Kristen Dalton. So we had some applicants, and she's an internal candidate, and we don't know exactly all the details, how it's going to work out. She works at our uh, front desk as our communications director uh, all week long, Monday through Thursday, plus she leads worship Wednesday nights at youth, and now Thursday night rehearsals here and Sunday morning. So um, she's got a lot on her plate, but we're going to figure it out, but we are super excited to have her. She's anointed, she's gifted, uh, and she's going to do a great job for us. So Kristen uh, Dalton, not pool. Uh, oh, man. Excited to make that announcement this morning. Uh, today we're continuing our series in Genesis, and so, uh, man, we encounter another difficult passage with a PG-13 rating, um, and, and so if they're little, little, if you got young children, probably under the age of six or so, they probably won't, they won't even know what's happening um, uh, in this passage. And a little bit older than that, uh, you could consider... Um, uh, fellowship kids, now would be a, a good time to take advantage of that, but we're discovering in, in the study of Genesis that the Bible is a very honest book, it's really super straightforward, um, and, and today we're definitely encountering some content that's like that. If you were here, oh, and by the way, I think this is the last PG-13 rating that we have in this series, I think we've got like five or six messages left, and this should, this should be it. Uh, today, though, uh, or if you were here last week, we met a guy named Joseph, uh, who we're going to be talking about a lot for the rest of the series. But in our study today, in this passage that we're taking a look at today, we're, we're taking an interesting break in the narrative uh, where it stops talking about Joseph for one chapter, and it talks about one of his big brothers, uh, a guy named Judah. And this becomes important because Judah is, is a very prominent character throughout the rest uh, of Scripture. So if you have your Bible or you have your Genesis journal, flip or turn with me to Genesis 38, and we will learn about one of Joseph's big brothers, this guy named Judah. This is Genesis 38, beginning in verse 1. It says this, It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adolamite, whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Kezeb when she bore him. Okay. So Judah, who we were introduced to last week, was one of 12 sons of a man named Jacob, um, or Israel, Jacob or Israel, those are kind of uh, interchangeable, and sometimes we see it as Jacob, sometimes we see it uh, as Israel, sometimes it's Jacob, which means deceiver, sometimes it's Israel, which means struggles with God, or wrestles with God. Judah, more specifically, is son number four. In the line of 12, he's number four, his mother is Leah, and for the context of this narrative, this story that we're about to read right here, most biblical scholars believe that Judah's roughly 21, 22 years um, old, years of age at this point. So, like lots of young men that age, Judah decides he's had enough of being at home, uh, he's going to strike out on his own, uh, he leaves his family behind, uh, and it doesn't tell us in the text why it is that Judah left. But I think we can sort of conjecture why. You see, he uh, was the one who successfully convinced his nine uh, older brothers, or nine of the oldest brothers, to sell their other brother, Joseph, 
into slavery and then pretend like Joseph died, put blood on his coat, and take the coat back to their father. You might remember this story from last week, right? The 10 older brothers uh, do this. They, they go home thinking um, they've solved the problem of their missing brother who they've sold into slavery, but they have a new problem because their dad, Jacob, is distraught, and he's in mourning. And so it seems plausible that Judah is just like, you know what? It's just like a matter of time before dad finds out about this. I mean, what are the odds? I got nine brothers that are in on this thing. One of those guys is going to rat me out. And so before that happens, before I get caught, before someone has to wrap me out, I think I'm just going to sneak off. And I'm, he, so, so that's what he does. He goes to another city, leaves behind his family, leaves behind the family business. And as we'll see in a little bit, he leaves behind the family religion. Judah's this 21, 22-year-old, classic, rebellious, I got to get out of the house, I got to go find my own way kind of guy. The text also tells us here he's got this buddy uh, named Hira, kind of feels like a frat brother, um, this guy named Hira that he hangs out with, and it's while he's hanging out with Hira, he meets a girl named Shua, falls in love, marries her, uh, and they have three kids, Ur, Onan, and Sheila. And this sounds okay, except the fact that his wife Shua is a Canaanite. And if you've been with us during the series, you might remember that God commanded his people not to, to marry the Canaanites. And this wasn't because of a, a race issue or anything like that. It's simply because the Canaanites worshipped other gods. They worshipped false gods. They worshipped idols. And so to set this scene, okay, Judah, one of the, the older brothers, he's brother number four, he, he leaves home, strikes out on his own, uh, meets and falls in love with a girl not of the same faith, marries her, and they have three boys. And then we get what I call Bible whiplash, because a period of 20 years or so transpires between verses five and six. It skips all the way to the point now where Judah's own sons are now of marrying age. So take a look, verse 6. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Okay, let's just pause uh, real quick. So so Ur's wicked. Uh, God killed him because he was evil. Uh, this is not one of the parts of God that we tend to like. This is not one of the parts of Scripture or the Bible um, that, that we like, but it's a very real part of the story. It's a very real part uh, of history here that God took an evil, wicked man, Ur, and killed him. And, and I think the, the struggle, it, and I don't know about for you, but for me, um, is we don't know why he was evil. And we don't know what it was that made him wicked. Uh, we, we don't even know how it was that God killed him. But we know that this is something that happens, that this is something that pops up in the scriptures from time to time. And it happens both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Lots of times people will say, well, God was just so angry in the Old Testament. He smite people, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But it happens in the New Testament as well. In fact, in, in Acts chapter 5, there's a couple, Ananias and Sapphira. You might know the story. They promised God. They, they've got this land that, they've, um, that, that they own, and, and so they make this deal with the local church there. And so they're going to sell this property and give all the proceeds to, to God and, and to the church. And uh, if you know the story, they don't do that. They hold some of it back for themselves. They, they lie. They hide a bunch of it, and God kills them for it. And, and we read stuff like this, and we think, that's terrible. But when we say that's terrible, what we're betraying is, is we don't realize how big of a deal sin is to God. See, God, when he created the world, he created it with, with certain moral parameters and certain moral boundaries. And he, he, he did that not because he's a cosmic killjoy, but because these parameters and these boundaries reflect his image and who he is and we're created in his image we become his image bearers and therefore we are bound to these parameters to these boundaries and any time we step outside of those boundaries we sin 
In fact, early on in the series, in, uh, when we were covering Genesis chapter 2 and 3, I gave you a definition of sin. And here's the definition of sin that I, I used months and months ago. It was, sin is any failure to reflect the image of God in nature, attitude, and action. Anytime we fail to reflect the image of God in nature, attitude, or action. So when we violate these parameters, we violate who God is, and when we imperfectly reflect who he is, that makes us sinners. We miss the mark. And this is a big deal, because you're like, well, why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal, because Paul tells us in Romans 6 that the wages of sin is death. This is what we deserve. Death is the consequence of sin. And so it's not terrible for God to demand a life for sin. What's terrible is when you and I sin against a holy and righteous God. And so Ur is wicked. God kills him. And, and then this triggers something interesting. Look in verse 8. Then Judah said to Onan, which is his second-born son, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Okay, pause. Um, this sounds really strange to us, does it not? But here's what you need to know. This was a common practice in this culture uh, that became a law. So this even existed before uh, the law. And you can read about this in Deuteronomy chapter 25. And the idea is this. If a woman became a widow before she had children, that her brother-in-law, if her husband had a brother, uh, would help her to have children so that her children then would become heirs of the family line, right? So everything is designed in this, this culture uh, to run through the eldest son, right? And, and so this would be the plan. And it would also protect uh, this young lady who had just become a widow. I mean, this is a really big deal. It's such a big deal. In fact, in Deuteronomy 25, it says, if a man refuses to do this, that uh, he's to be drugged before the elders, and the elders are trying to convince him. Like, he's trying to back out of the deal, and the elders are to try to convince him. Like, hey, man, you need to step up to the plate. This is called being a kinsman redeemer. You got to step in for the family. You got to help your sister-in-law out here. I know that you, you're not necessarily looking for another wife. Uh, she might not be pretty. He might not even like her, but it's your responsibility. It's your duty, and if the elders can't convince him uh, to do that, uh, to take on that responsibility, then the widow is to take his sandal off, her brother-in-law's sandal off, and spit in his face in front of everybody in the community. She's, it, it, it's designed to humiliate him in front of the entire faith community. And it, why it's a big deal is because widows in that culture and down throughout much of history have been in an extremely economically disadvantaged position. Um, like the very nature of being a widow. I mean, just think about it in this scenario. The very nature of being a widow who doesn't have any children that can help take care of her, who doesn't have a husband that can help take care of her. I mean, if she was young, if she was like in her 20s, like uh, most ladies that had been widowed like this or divorced, a man wasn't even looking to marry them. So let's just say she's 20, 21 years old, her husband dies, she doesn't have any children. It's likely that she's not going to remarry for the rest of her life. She's going to be destitute from a very early age. This is why this is a big deal. That's why the Bible from cover to cover talks about taking care of widows. And Psalm 146 says, God supports the widow. God upholds the widow. Uh, the book of James says, what, religion that is pure and undefiled is, is what before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. In, in the book of Acts, when we see the, the church launch, launching uh, and planting and spreading throughout the world, they get, you get to chapter 6, and do you know what the very first crisis the church encountered was? how to take care of widows. I and mean, we just see it cover to cover. God's consistent message to widows as well as orphans is this. Hey, I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to use other people to take care of you. 
That's why as a church family here at FBC, we've been involved historically, traditionally over the years in ministries just like this, like Family Promise, like Foster and Adopt, like the Legacy Closet, like Hannah House. The list kind of goes on and on and on because this is who we are as the people of God. God always uses people to take care of those in need. And Judah knows all about this law. He knows about this law, and so he says to son number two, to his son Onan, I want you to take care of your sister-in-law, because um, that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, Judah's got a little bit of redeeming quality here. Take care of your sister-in-law. But Onan doesn't seem too keen on the idea. Now, I'm not going to read verse 9 out loud, but here's what's happening. Onan is uh, instituting his own method of birth control. And because of that, it says, verse 10, and what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death also. Um, The problem is that Onan was the second born male, right? The oldest male, Ur, we've already read about him. He was wicked, evil, God killed him, which means now Onan gets the inheritance. Um, The oldest brother is out of the picture, And so Onan knows that one day when dad dies, whatever inheritance that there is to get from Judah, um, he's going to get some of that. So he's not real anxious to give his sister-in-law children because if he's to give his sister-in-law children, then then they um, now would get that inheritance because things flow that direction. Does that make sense to you? Some people have used this passage to declare that God's anti-birth control. I don't believe that's what this passage is about. I believe that God is anti-selfishness. I believe that God is anti-greed. I believe that God is anti-sin. And when we do anything because of selfishness or greed, it's sin. That's what's happening here. And so now we've got Tamar. She's a widow uh, not just one time, but now she's a widow two times. Verse 11, then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up, for he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. Okay, we get this, right? I'm, I'm kind of like with Judah here. It's like, hey, we've got to run a bad luck here. Uh, Sheila, at this age, he's probably 11 or 12 years old. You you can't marry him yet. Instead of hanging out here, you'd probably be more comfortable back at home with your own family. So why don't you go back home and hang out with your parents for a while? And then one day when Sheila, he's not 11 or 12 anymore, maybe one day when he's 17, 18, 19, uh, he's got a solid job, um, he can come and take care of you. Um. And so what Judah says and what he means are two different things here, right? I mean, that's what he's saying to Tamar. Just just wait for Sheila to grow up and then he can take care of you. What he means is, I blame you for killing my boys. uh, They have a term for the black widow. That's like, hey, uh, son number one has died. We We don't know why, but you were married to him. Then son number two steps in and now he's dead. Uh, There is no way. I'm going to let you marry son number three. Not going to happen. And then a certain amount of time transpires. Again, another Bible whiplash year. Likely years takes place. Verse 12. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shears. He and his friend Hira, the Adolamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garment and covered herself with a veil. So for years, she's been in mourning. And and, and what do we, you know, funerals and memorial services, we typically wear black. And so just imagine that. She's probably been dressed in black. People would be able to look at her and know that she's a widow by the way she's dressed. And so she takes off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance to Anaim, which is on the road to Timnah. 
for she saw that Sheila was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. Okay, light bulb goes off. She realizes, oh, Sheila's old enough now. He's grown up. He's 18, 19 years old, probably has a stable job, but he hasn't come calling for me. And she realizes that Judah's not going to follow through with his commitment, that he has absolutely no intention to let Sheila marry um, her. And so she creates a plan. Um, She sets a trap, and she sets a trap knowing full well something about her father-in-law's character. Let's take a look. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, come, let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge until you send it. In other words, hey, I'm not traveling around with a goat, but I'll take something exchange, you know, for the goat, just so I know you'll fulfill your promise. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So she gave, uh, so he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adolamite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. When he asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who is at Anaim at the roadside? They said, no cult prostitute's been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I've not found her. Also, the men of the place said, no cult prostitute's been there. And Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat and you did not find her. Okay, um, let's camp out here for a minute. Tamar somehow knows something about Judah's character and his weakness for prostitutes. And so she decides, you know, I'm going to set a trap for my father-in-law. And she sets this trap knowing he's going to fall for it. That's the reason she takes off her her mourning clothes, her funeral clothes, and puts on more attractive clothing, and she hangs out on the street um, that's near where he's going to be passing by because she knows something about his character. And so she shows up there, and he sees her, and something about her is attractive, or he just knows that she's a prostitute, and and so they begin to engage in conversation, and they're exchanging, like they're negotiating back and forth for the price of this act, and she does something incredibly shrewd. She asks him for his signet ring, um, for his uh, staff, and for his cord. These are things, this doesn't mean a whole lot to you and I, but these are things that, would, that he would be carrying around that would identify him as him. It, it would be like um, my driver's license, <clears throat> my wallet, and my little work ID. Right? Some of you work in businesses where you get little work ID, you know, unlock a door or wear it around, you know, in a lanyard or whatever. S- something like that. It's three pieces of identification, and, and people would have known, hey, this, this is who this person is. These things uh, identify this man. These things identify Judah. Uh, A modern day example of this whole entire story, and I'm just using this as an example, okay, Um, would be like a modern day businessman's flying to Vegas. He's a married guy. He flies to Vegas for a conference because they're always doing conferences in Vegas. He flies there for a conference, decides he's going to hook up with the prostitute. He doesn't have any money. And they negotiate a price, he and the prostitute, and she's like, it's going to be X. And he's like, okay, let me run to the ATM. And she's like, okay, well, while you're gone running to the ATM, let me hold on uh, to your uh, driver's license, to your wallet, and to your work ID. And he's like, sure, here you go. He runs off to the ATM, gets some money, comes back, she's gone. Stupid plan. I don't advocate that, but that's a stupid move. So Tamar knows Judah's going to fall for this. And the thing is, when you read commentaries, 
when you read about this story, um, there's two common reactions to the way that Tamar behaved here. There's the more conservative side who says, look, man, she, she was married. That guy died. She married another guy. He died. She sleeps with the father-in-law. She is a terrible, terrible person. And, and then there's the other side of like, oh, my gosh, the, the injustice that's happened to her. You go, girl. This is not your fault. This stuff has happened to you. You, you, you're being mistreated here. And they're both kind of right and they're both kind of wrong. The bottom line is they're both sinners. Judah and Tamar. His sin leads to her sin, but his sin does not excuse her sin. Judah refused to be used of God to protect Tamar. Instead, he used her. And Tamar, instead of trusting God, um, she takes things into her own hands and it becomes this endless cycle of sin. Let's continue, verse 24. About three months later, she's beginning to show now. Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has been immoral. Moreover, she's pregnant by immorality. Meaning she just wasn't married. She didn't have a husband. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Judah's been looking for a reason, right, to not take care of Tamar, and now he sees an opening. And it's like, what a double standard, right? I mean, he can sleep with whoever he wants. He can go pick up a prostitute uh, on the street, but as soon as he finds out that she's pregnant, he wants her dead. And as she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom these things belong, I am pregnant. And she said, I, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. She's so much more conniving than he is. She's basically saying, hey, if you're going to burn me at the stake, then find uh, the guy that owns all of these things, and then let's burn him too while we're at it. And then Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I since I did not give her to my son, Shelah, and he did not know her again. So, so Judah is humiliated. He's beginning to realize, I think, the depth of his sin here, right? He, he's realizing that, yes, uh, they both committed sin, but, but his sin is worse. He, he knows that he was supposed to take care of her. And here's the thing, and I read the story, I go, you know, we all struggle with sin, but it's, it's easy for us to downplay our own sin and elevate the sin of other people, isn't it? In fact, during this message, we've actually been talking about um, two types of sin here. We've been talking about sins of commission, sins that we commit. We've been talking about sins of Omission, like the sin of social injustice that's taking place here. Uh, those are sins of omission, like something we don't do. And the Bible talks about sins of commission and sins of omission, and it's so easy for us to get smug when we're like really good at one and then we stink at the other, right? Like we might be following God in our, our sexuality, meaning we just, uh, we're, we're living a sexually pure life and we don't even look at other women and so we don't lust and so we're doing everything right and we're looking down our nose at a sexually um, overt and impure culture uh, and the whole time that we're doing that, we're ignoring the needs of people around us. And then you could be, hyper-socially aware and taking care of homeless people and meeting needs all the time and living a sexually impure life. If you're here today, maybe you feel like Judah in this story. You've been blind to like your own hypocrisy, but you're reading this narrative today and God's word is just like it's just exposing your ring and your cord and your staff. And now maybe today in this moment you're feeling that conviction of your sin or maybe you're like Tamar. 
and you've responded to sin that's been committed to you or against you by committing your own sins. And maybe you even feel a little bit smug and self-righteous as you compare yourself to others. And then you look at the story and you realize it's really not about comparing yourself um, to someone else. It's about comparing yourself to God. And compared to God, none of us are righteous. But the good news is, this is not where the story ends. Look at verse 27. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out, and she said, what a breach you've made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zira. And you're like, what a weird and odd detail. It must be telling us something important, but what is it? We'll flip all the way to Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, we see the genealogy of Jesus. And here's what it says. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And, and so here's what's interesting. The genealogy mentions both of the boys here. Um instead of just the one that the family line came through. And typic, that's typically what would happen. Just tell, tell me the son who's carrying on the family line. And here it mentions both, and it's like, why did it mention both? Well, I believe it's there to remind us that as God's sovereign plan unfolds, that Jesus came from a human line filled with sin and flawed people. And from Judah and Tamar. We get Jesus. In closing, let me just say, one of the many reasons that I believe that the Bible is the Word of God and that it documents real events is the fact that it just doesn't hide the flaws of the people that it accounts for us. So hear me out. This is no excuse to go mess up your life. I believe that a, a person who's following God, who's um, given their life to Jesus Christ, is someone who wants to follow Jesus, and, and doing so means you're growing and you're maturing uh, in faith and you're learning to be more like Jesus, the only perfect person who's ever lived. But what I am telling you is this morning, that despite our flaws, God wants to use us. God wants to use you. The question is, Will you let him? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Let's pray together. Now, Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, this crazy story uh, about Judah and Tamar. Um, it feels weird to thank you for people who are terrible in so many ways, and yet we thank you that you worked through them to show us a little bit of a picture of how you feel about sin, um, about sexual sin, um, uh, about social injustice. And we thank you for the great, 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 great grandson Jesus who came to save the world. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.